I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And this is Come Follow Me Insights. We're here on a Saturday morning in Springville, Utah, because Saturday is a special day. It's the day we get ready for Sunday. Hey, that has a nice ring to it. You should I, write a song. I would love to do that. Actually, we could probably sing it for everybody. Yeah. Taylor and I don't usually come to the, to the studio here in Book of Mormon Central on Saturday. Uh, but because of everything that's been going on the past week and the past few days especially, um, we thought this was uh, an important opportunity for us to just share some thoughts surrounding the fact that while formal public church gatherings have been canceled, the gospel has not. In fact, the, this gives us some very, very unique opportunities individually as well as collectively to find ways to sink some roots deeper into the gospel of, of conversion and into our, our commitment to Christ and to his uh, covenantal connections with us and maybe rely less on some of the, the support uh, scaffolding that has been there for, for centuries in, in many cases or at least decades and many years and to, to turn upward, heavenward, and find better ways to connect with, with the Savior as well as with our loved ones and with those closest to us. The world always has times of difficulty. I mean, if you look at human history, there's always been times of challenge, and sometimes those challenges get really difficult. And even in our own lives, we have cycles of, of testing and challenge. And I just want to briefly, just very quickly, write a word on the board. Right. Once a month, we do testimony meeting. And it's interesting, the word testimony comes from the word test. And testimony meeting is about us talking about the truths we've learned because of tests that we've experienced. And so in this moment of difficulty, we might say to ourselves, this is a bit of a test. And as we experience this test, we will gain or enhance our testimonies of truths about God's character and about ourselves and about our communities and things that will help us endure to the end. So a, a poem that uh, President Thomas S. Monson used to love and, and recite on a couple of occasions when he was our prophet says, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, a narrow word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. As the world is, is struggling right now with uncertainty and with stock markets going down and then up and down and, and sporting events and schools and, and uh, plays and all these cultural events being canceled and temples being uh, closed for, for proxy ordinances and missionaries being sent home, it, it can create a feeling of, of panic and a feeling of, oh no, what's happening, when in reality uh, this, is, this really is a beautiful opportunity for us individually as well as collectively to reevaluate what really is the most important thing or things in my life, in our conversion, in our, in our worship opportunities. And you look at the situation with our church and people now having to worship at home. Isn't it a beautiful thing that we have prophets, seers, and revelators through whom the Lord Jesus Christ has been directing from the beginning of time in, in putting things in place to make it so that we don't have to be perplexed, we don't have to be panicked, we don't have to be uh, filled with anxiety. There, behind all of this uncertainty, behind all these question marks, there stands the quiet figure of the Lord of the outstretched arms, who holds worlds without number in his hand. He knows what he's doing, and he's put things in place with home-centered curriculum, with ministering, with being able to, to rely on those relationships at home to help strengthen each other like never before in probably the history of the world and now we get to live through these days. There was never a better time to be alive than right now. We're going to spend just a few minutes talking today about things that you can do 
even though the world seems to be a bit disrupted, what can we do to continue to be centered on Jesus Christ? And this is an opportunity for all of us, as Tyler was saying, to sink our roots deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what could we do to be serving others? We, we think about maybe text messages, right? Well, we have ancient text messages in the scripture, so make sure to pay attention to those text messages God has shared. You have modern day text messages, right, from the prophets who are talking, and then make sure that you are in your ministering capacity communicating with others. Sure, there's social distance, but you can still have the intimate distance of phone calls or video conferences, and be close to those that you serve and that you care about. So this is these powerful words here, trust. God wants us to trust us. He wants us to trust Jesus. If you think about the tree of life uh, stories we have in 1 Nephi, God is demonstrating that those who trust him hold on to his word and they find their way, even through all the thick darkness that seems to envelop them, you hold on and you find your way to the tree of life. Now it's interesting, that's a form of trust to hold on, to trust that if you keep walking forward, you will make your way to the tree. What I love about the word trust is it comes from the same root word as tree. You can actually can see it here in these letters. And one more word that is really fun that connects to all these is the word truth. So if you want to trust God, seek him at the tree and you will find truth. So in these moments of difficulty, think back about the tree of life story. And yes, we don't like the chaos that we see in the world around us, but just know God foresaw this and he has actually put out the iron rod. There's a tree out there where we can partake of the fruit and just, just hold on. And even if you can't see what's going on, trust that as you press forward, you will experience the truth, you'll get to the tree and you will find the peace that God has designed for all of us. It's beautiful. So I wanna show one other concept, I learned this from my, my dear friend and uh, a colleague up in uh, Cache Valley, Mark Weiss. It's this concept that God leaves some things in question for us because it allows us to then exercise faith and, and grow in our ability to trust that which we, we don't know yet. So there are some major questions that we usually need to answer. There are others, the who, the where, the when, but the three main ones that consistently come up in Scripture are what, how, and why. And uh, here's the, the point. Think of a Scripture story or think of a time in your own life when God has given a, a command or put you in a situation or a setting where you have, to, you have to navigate that setting, you have to act in some way, and he's answered the question what he wants you to do, how he wants you to do it, and why he wants you to do it. If you think about it, those experiences are probably really rare, and for some of us, they don't exist, because God usually leaves at least one of these with a question mark. Let me give you a little example that will, will be relevant to our situation. As you're trying to figure out how do you move forward as an individual or as a family in this new realm where you're not going to church, you can't go to the temple for proxy ordinances, you're, you're supposed to keep this social isolation, so to speak, social distance, how do you do that? Well, quick example from the scriptures, Nephi is commanded by the Lord through Lehi with his brothers to go back to Jerusalem to get the plates, right? He knows what he's supposed to do, get the plates. He even is given a few reasons why. He's not given them all, They'll, the, the, the bulk of those reasons are going to come later, but he has a pretty good idea why. He just doesn't have any idea how, and going into it he's thinking, oh, we've got this, we'll just go up and let's draw straws and whoever gets it, go in and ask Laban. Well, that's fail, failed attempt number one. Um, so then he thinks, hmm, that didn't work. Uh, he wanted to kill you, so we've got to really up the ante. Let's go and get the gold, silver, and precious things. Let's try that. Um, when that attempt fails and we lose those, those precious things to Laban, 
many people would be tempted to say it's a total failure. Uh, Elder David A. Bednar has made um, a beautiful point on this that those were not failures. Those were learning opportunities for Nephi to say he just found out two ways not to get the plates. They weren't failures. He learned, he grew, he developed in the process. Brothers and sisters, you and you and us, we're all going to have experiences like this as we're trying to navigate these question marks as we move forward into territory where none of us have ever been before. And it's okay. We can, we can be patient with ourselves. We can be patient with our families and with those around us. People are going to make some decisions and do some things that you feel like is a failure. It's okay. We continue to learn from it, <clears throat> move forward in faith, and now here's the point. Chapter 4 of 1 Nephi says in verse 6, I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. That is a beautiful place to be in life. When you've exhausted all of your best thinking, your best resources, you're, you're out of options it seems, and you then find yourself in a place where you, you can no longer turn horizontally and say, let's solve this, but you now are forced in a, in a gentle way to turn upward and say, what would thou have me do? That will I do. That's where beautiful things can start to flow as that scripture can be fulfilled where God promises that he will pour down knowledge upon the heads of his saints in section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants. <clears throat> Look at verse 7 now. Nevertheless, so the nevertheless refers to I didn't know what to do, nevertheless I went forth. Um, that is a beautiful principle for all of us to move forward. Nevertheless, I went forth. God lets us wrestle sometimes a lot longer than we think we should in order to find answers to these questions, and sometimes it's not the how that you're being, uh, that you're wrestling with. Sometimes you're wrestling with a why. Classic example being Adam and Eve. They, they leave the Garden of Eden, they build an altar and offer sacrifice in the Book of Moses for many, many days. And it's after many of those opportunities when this, the angel of the Lord comes to them and says, Adam, why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And his response was, I know not. I don't know. Um, and then the angel, after Adam and Eve have passed that test of faith. They've, they've developed a deep, deep trust in God with something that would be very uncomfortable to do. They did it anyway, and then they get the answer, and the question mark becomes a foundational exclamation point for them moving forward when the angel says, you're doing this as a similitude of the only begotten of the Father. Everything that you do you're going to repent. Everything you do is going to point you to Christ, who is your Savior, and so that grand why is now answered for him and for us moving forward. Um, <clears throat> Elder Neil L. Anderson, one of my favorite phrases on this topic from him is, uh, you don't know everything, but you know enough. We, we don't have the answers, <laughs> but we know enough to trust that Jesus stands at the head of this work, and he is in charge of accelerating his work, and he's going to do that through his appointed prophets, seers, and revelators. What a privilege to be able to be on the earth at a time when they are speaking for him in such profound ways using all of these means that God has inspired, technology, what we're doing right here, all of these capacities that we now have to build the kingdom of God on the earth, on both sides of the veil, it's, I've said it before, I'll say it again, there was never a better time to be alive than right now. I agree with Tyler. I didn't intend to do this when I was a kid, but I ended up spending many years studying most of human history. And what I learned is that of all the time periods in human history, there's never been a better time even though there's still challenges and difficulties and pain and chaos, 
We live in the greatest of times, and mostly that is because we have the restoration. So we're going to point your minds forward a bit in Scripture to King Benjamin's speech. Pretty soon in Come Follow Me, we'll be talking about it. And I want to read a verse that I think is very relevant to what's going on right now. It's Mosiah chapter 2, verse 6. And they pitched their tents round about the temple, every man having his tent with the door thereof towards the temple, that thereby they might remain in their tents and hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. Let's liken this unto ourselves. What if we retranslate this a bit and said, and they pitched their homes or their come follow me family experiences round about the temple. Every family having his home with their devices or their scriptures of their heart pointed towards the temple and God's leaders and particularly to Jesus Christ, that thereby they might remain in their homes and hear the words which God's chosen leaders, like the prophets, should speak unto them. Uh, that's exactly what's going on right now. So there's still plenty of opportunities, opportunities for us to be centered on Jesus and hearing his word and also take the time to share the word with others. This is an enormously opportune time to talk to others on the phone or through video chats or text messaging or email and empower uh, uh, and strengthen others with sharing your testimony about what you've learned about God in your life and how you've trusted him to help you endure other difficult times. And in, the, in these moments, we'll be able to endure to the end. God gives us that power. I love the, love the analogy of taking the doors of our home, these devices and our, our thoughts and our heart and pointing them, turning them towards the temple and towards God and towards his mouthpieces, those watchmen on the tower. Um, in contrast to that, watch what happened in the Old Testament with Lot and his family. Uh, they move into the, the valley the, the, near the cities of the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah, and they pitch their tent in the plains with the tent door facing Sodom. It's just a few verses later when we find out that Lot's family has now moved into Sodom. And then it's just a few verses later when we realize that Sodom has moved into Lot's family, and it's, it's a painful story. The principle here is our family and our individual lives will move in the direction that we're facing. So this is a beautiful opportunity for us to realign, reevaluate what really matters. Why are we really here on this earth? What, what is life all about, really? Is it about the sporting events, the vacations, the entertainment, or is it about figuring out how to connect more meaningfully, more powerfully with God, with his son, with our loved ones, with our neighbors, in ways that really produce what uh, I believe President Nelson would call enduring joy on the covenant path. This is a beautiful opportunity where Christ has, has taken away some of the scaffolding for a short time. It, it'll come back, but for a short time to get us to really experience some deep, deep levels of trust and faith in him as we move forward and build the kingdom. So to conclude, we live in a time when there are a lot of question marks for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. There are questions and concerns regarding health and regarding the whole coronavirus outbreak and what's it going to do to affect the economy, your family, your job, your, your own personal health and your, the, the health of your loved ones. Uh, I want to just say what I know. I know that we are children of heavenly parents who love us. I know that we have a savior. The, the Lord Jesus Christ stands at the head of this work, always has and always will, and he knows what's best for us individually and collectively. And he loves you and he loves all of us and it's our opportunity to trust him with a deeper level of trust than we've perhaps ever had before collectively as a group. And as we do that, his kingdom will roll forward in, in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones and, and in the whole world on both sides of the veil. 
So even though we may be experiencing some short-term uh, struggles with what's going on, know that this opportunity to send our roots deeper is going to produce incredible fruits down the road if we'll just trust him and follow his prophets. We sure love you. We know God loves you. And many blessings to you as you spread light and goodness during these times.